Rebecca, welcome to the Exorcism Podcast. It's fantastic to have you here. I'm very privileged to be able to have a chat with you what, at seven seven thirty in the morning on your side, and <laughs> now it is four thirty p.m. on my side. So, uh, welcome. Whereabouts exactly are you in the world? I am located in Seattle, Washington. So I'm calling you bright and early over here. Oh, a nice one. And and I, I gather the coffee has been poured and. You are you. You've got the refill on the on the go, and it's warm and, and ready for the day. Oh yes, right next to me, I've got an extra Chemex, and uh, my day is going to be well fueled. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. So, so Rebecca, welcome. Um, I know a little bit about you from uh, your involvement with exorcism, specifically with the Unison track itself. But before we get on to digging into that a little bit. Um, I'd love to just find out a little bit about yourself and uh, how you ended up uh, in Seattle, a little bit of, um, it is Seattle. I did say Seattle. Am I right, right in saying Seattle? Yes. I did. Yeah. I thought for a second I had like memory like a fish and I'd forgotten where you live, but it is Seattle. <laughs> um, I'd love to find out a little bit about how you ended up there, um, a little bit about yourself, a little bit of your story, and then, and then how you ended up in tech and kind of what sparked you uh, to go down that road in your life. Yeah, so my family actually uh, immigrated directly to Seattle um, six generations ago. So we're a really long time uh, immigrant family here in Seattle. Um, and I love it here. Uh, I went to school around here. And um, it's actually a pretty integral part of how I got into tech. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, Seattle is a really big tech city. Um, but I didn't actually study programming in at university. I studied English with a focus in poetics. And so it might seem like English. it's really, yes. Yeah. It okay. might seem like wow. it's an odd That's fit, cool. but I, I think it's relevant in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I uh, went to school here at the university of Washington. Um, I was in Portland working in higher education for my first career. So working with students you know, trying to reduce the, the achievement gap, uh, for folks and keep mm -hmm. people in college. That was my, my, my job as an executive life coach for students. Um, and that was amazing, but, um, I worked with a lot of online colleges and I saw the mm -hmm. ways in which my students really struggled with the technology platforms, the ways mm -hmm. that technology was also enabling them to, you know, have mm -hmm. better experiences and, to kind of transform their lives and, and help reduce generational cycles of um, poverty or oppression. Um, and I wanted to be involved in that in kind of a hands-on way. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps, perhaps selfishly, you know, education is, is really hard uh, for a lot of reasons. It's really lovely, but it, it's also really mm -hmm. challenging. And in technology, you do get to feel like you make progress every week. And um, it, mm -hmm. it sort of sparked a, a problem solving um, aspect for what I wanted for my career. So I kind of changed paths and uh, applied to a school called Ada Developers Academy, which is located back in mm -hmm. Seattle. So that's what brought me kind of full okay. circle, um, ended up moving back okay. and did the year long program there. So hang on. So you, you grew up in Seattle and then you moved away to work, uh, to start your career. Where did you leave to go to from Seattle? What time I went to, to, to Portland. So just like a little bit South okay. of Seattle. Yeah. Okay. I see. Okay, cool. And then, so, so now you did languages, poetry, English, literature. Um, mm -hmm. I did that as well, uh, but at, at high school and I loved English and all of that kind of stuff. So I was like, woohoo, another English literature yes. student. Um, <laughs> but, um, tell me about the first, like the, the process of going from your seeing all of these problems being solved in front of you in terms of technology and all of that deciding to take the leap how did that process how did you decide to like okay i need to leave and and break the career pathway and move into something completely different like what was that like you know it it was a little bit it was a little bit luck um because i i had been feeling like wow i see my students you know either doing really well or really struggling with this and i want to be involved i'm not sure how other than what i'm doing right now and i know you know, it's not feeding a part of what I want in my daily workflow. 
Um, and so just halfway out of boredom, I started learning like HTML, CSS on my lunch breaks. Mm -hmm. And I would just like practice making little websites or little web forms. Um, and, and I did completely f free uh, learning materials at the time. Um, and uh, it was just kind of self-studying and being like, what is this whole, you know, internet thing <laughs> about? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is still a question I ask myself, um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it just sort of, uh, I don't know, I just kind of fell in love with programming. Um, it felt, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, the closest thing to magic in, in some ways to like make a little <laughs> turtle like move yep. around on the screen or make a square show up. Um, so uh, yeah, and I, I just figured, okay, well, I like this and I also like the mission of this mm -hmm. and how do I bring those two things in conversation um, mm -hmm. uh, and just sort of formed a career out of asking myself that question over and over again. Cool. And, and so the process then of learning to code and, and going from a, well, learning how to conceptualize and frame what was going on on the computer, but sort of have a mental model for it. I mean, one of the things that's interesting when I talk to a lot of people, and, and I would actually say is true of, of my own experience with development, because I'm sort of slowly encroaching in on that space piece by piece, um, was having a, a mental model for what's going on and being able to generate that in your mind it is a huge part of, of learning to code. So how did, how did you do that? Like, what was the, how did you find out about how you learned, if that makes sense. Mm. So um, you're looking at C C HTML and you're like, okay, cool. How did you kind of start to order that information in your brain, if, if that makes any sense whatsoever? Mm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. How, how, how did I kind of formalize that? Um, I think one of the things that was drilled into me from – my education in literature was, you know, you read carefully and you, you read, read between the lines and you pay attention to the form of things. And I think a, a program has a form. Um, I worked in typed languages. And so like, there's, there's very specific, like there's ways in which you can write a truly non-compiling thing. Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> When I program, I, I like to think about like, okay, what's the this, this sort of structure of, of the goal? What's the narrative? Um, and I know that may be atypical, you know, a sort of very atypical way of imagining, you know, what a computer is doing or, or putting, you know, A, a and B together. Um, but yeah, I've, I've always just thought about, okay, what if, if I imagine the computer as a, as my protagonist, what's, what is it doing at points A, B, and C? Um, and how does it achieve the goal that, that I, that I want it to do? And it may not be as interesting a story as like, you know, Finnegan's Wake, but <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, uh, <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. maybe, <laughs> maybe opinions vary about that, but um, you know, uh, that, that's kind of the, the model I've adopted. That's fascinating because what you talk about now, I can totally, I can totally place that onto a program or code. Like you have your scenes, you have your characters, which you could mm -hmm. say are like variables or you have then the plot, <laughs> which is the kind of fun. We could go down a huge rabbit hole, but maybe, maybe you're going to come across some form of teaching English literature students how to actually become developers. But, but I think the reason I asked that is because, um, rewiring and a lot of people learning to code are actually having to come from a new career or from an mm -hmm. old career, excuse me, and, and actually learning to swap around and find ways to re-engage mentally. Uh, and, um, you know, so I was speaking to Bobby Towers, one of our other contributors, you, you might know him, but he, um, he comes from a musical background, like highly musical background. Mm -hmm. And he's developed like his own one handed keyboard, um, to be able to type one handed because he'd had an accident, um, with, with his, his other arm. And I'm sure he won't mind me sharing that, but it was really interesting having a conversation with him about how he understands music and the patterns and the things that are very typical of music and how they translate into development. And I think what's exciting about these conversations is I'm realizing that everyone has a very, um, has their own unique way of 
taking the information that's out there in documentation, very pragmatic information and scientific information and bringing it a flavor of their own. So that's, that's really, really interesting. So mm. you've started like learning how to code you, CSS, HTML, starting to frame things, starting to build a narrative with your, in your mind, you could say, how did you then deepen that knowledge and what happened when you hit like a roadblock mentally where you found it really hard to kind of push through and see the wood from the trees? How did you find mm. those obstacles and how did you overcome them? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think I encounter the obstacles all the time. Like I'm definitely, you know, mm -hmm. uh, continually running up against the, the wall. Um, and the thing that has really helped me, I think, in those moments is to draw on, on a network of people. Um, you know, it's really been community and friendship and mentorship that have helped me uh, when I've encountered, you know, hard challenges or even just things that are that are new. Um, so, you know, for example, when I did my my internship um uh, right after uh, my programming school, I, I had a really good friend kind of going through it, through it with me. And, and she was there um, to, to kind of normalize, like if I was ever feeling like, oh, I don't know this and maybe I should know it. Mm -hmm. I could go and, and talk to my friend and be like, do you know this? And she'd be like, no, how would we know that? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, the ability you to the kind of... documentation. Yeah, so, you know, I think having people around me helped normalize where I was in my journey uh, and people mm -hmm. have been really generous with, you know, their time and their support. And so like, you know, my attitude mm -hmm. always um, is to just pay that forward um, mm -hmm. because yeah, it, it's been community that's really kind of helped, held me afloat uh, through hard times. Um, that's really cool. And so you did a year of like boot camp, could you say? Could you call it a boot camp or was it more like a specific um, school? I mean, not that there's much difference, but. Um... Yeah, I think it's might be classified as a boot camp. Um, the program ADA mm -hmm. is, I think, unique uh, in some ways because it's not, um, you mm -hmm. don't pay to go. It, it does not have a tuition model. Mm -hmm. So as a student, you mm -hmm. apply and there's, you know, some pretty rigorous um, application processes. And then if you're selected, then, um, it's companies who, uh, want an intern through this pipeline, um, uh, uh. they see the value in this program, um, that actually sponsor the whole, whole school, um, as well as grants and other nonprofit sources. So, um, it, it's really incredible, you know, as a model, because as a student, you know, it's, it's hard enough to like go without an income mm -hmm. for a year as you're, as you're learning, um, so that the fact that I didn't have to, to pay additional tuition was really helpful, um, for, for that. Okay. So you, so you essentially got sponsored prior to the, so did a company say, yeah, we'll sponsor you. And then you work for them at, at the end. Was that kind of how it worked or was it you passed the test and then at the end there was like an opportunity that was sort of given over to you to engage in Was that yeah, it's right. it's more the latter. So at the time, what mm. what companies would do is they would sponsor, you know, a, a number of people, um, and mm -hmm. then the school would say, okay, well, so we can admit that many. And then at a, the midpoint of the year, you have this sort of shuffling where everyone kind of interviews with different companies, and they're kind of mm -hmm. feeling out what could be a good match. Um, and okay. then, uh, they run an algorithm, an optimal match algorithm. Um, and then you end up with really? a company. They did yeah, that? they do. They, they actually yeah. did that? So uh -huh. it was, yeah, wow. it's kind of like the match That's algorithm for medical residencies. Okay. I see. Yeah. Interesting. And, um, okay. So now what did you study at that year? Like, was it, um, kind of JavaScript traditional, well, let's, I'm now going to get a lot of hate now for calling JavaScript a traditional coding language, but <laughs> what was the, was that the kind of, what was the curriculum like? And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So at the time the curriculum was a Ruby based curriculum. And so, you know, you would learn HTML, CSS, and then for sort of web application development, you would use, uh, Ruby rails, Sinatra for kind of web framework stuff. Um, and then uh, we also used Angular um, for more front end development because that was a component as well. Um, and it was a lot of teaching us about 
OAuth, API integrations, how to stitch together different parts of an application. Um, and it was a really collaborative workflow as well. So they tried to mimic as closely as possible, you know, what it would be like to work on a, on a team together. Um, so that, that was really cool too. So it was a really kind of hands-on practical education in software. Okay. Well, and okay. So that, that's, I'm just going through, I, I love just hearing the story of how people ended up where they ended up. So then you work for Unison, which is a language, <laughs> right? Now, how did that come about off the back of all of this? And maybe you can just explain a little bit about Unison um, for everyone out there, just so that they have an understanding of what that looks like. And we'll, we'll put everything in the show notes anyway as well, so that people can go and have a look. But um, yeah, explain. Go for it. Right. Yeah. So uh, Unison Computing is the company I work for, and we're writing a new programming language called called Unison. Um, and the sort of core difference with this programming language is that your code base is not a mutable bag of, of text files. It's uh, all your functions are mm -hmm. hashed to an AST, and they are content addressed. And, you know, that's a lot of technical stuff. Um, <laughs> the, the, the benefit to use a programmer as a working programmer is um, things like distributing a computation programmatically becomes really simple. Mm -hmm. There's a whole class of, of issues around serialization and deserialization de of data um, that kind of goes away if your code can be programmatically um, uh, addressed and, and retrieved. Um, so okay. we, we are really interested in improving the the working workflow of, of programmers with our programming language um, and enabling people to write full-scale distributed systems just with one programming language, you know, uh, not having to uh, consider some of the costs operationally and intellectually of, of a fully um, realized production mm -hmm. system. So, yeah. Uh, so would that be like... <laughs> Back end, front front end, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong. But would that mean you could write a, a full web application in one language across the board, front end, back end, all the other stuff? Am we're, I, we're truly a back end. A a, okay. Yeah, we're truly a back end uh, language. The real intervention there is that there's a whole set of like operational complexity around, like say. Uh, managing a Kubernetes cluster or managing, mm -hmm. you know, a, a zookeeper cluster um, uh, or even just a fleet of microservices that um, yeah. Unison can describe programmatically and then uh, run a program against without, you know, uh, you having to kind of do all that work. Okay. And, and what is it that you do for Unison on like a day-to-day -day basis? Like what is your involvement there and what are the, what are the pros and the, the things that you really enjoy and what are the things that maybe you find like, oh, I wish this would be better or different? How's, <laughs> how's the day? How's the week? Yeah. What are you doing uh, today? I don't know. Uh, yeah. Today, so today I, hopefully I have got a website deployment that I really want to knock out. So I'm mm -hmm. going to be improving some of our documentation, like our language documentation. Um, and the, the big goal this week has been, um, I'm working on a set of exercises for our distributed ecosystem, some of which might show up on exorcism. So check, check out our track. Okay. Um, so okay. My, my role there. is gentle plug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, my role is to help people learn unison and to feel like they okay. can step into the language and gain working proficiency and feel welcomed um, and mm -hmm. you know get the information that they need to 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 realize mm -hmm. whatever their their goal is. Um, so yeah, it, and any that sort of a grab bag of of activities is what it ends up being during the week because someone might need troubleshooting or another person will be like this link is wrong on the website. So it does kind of vary. Yeah, yeah. Um, that I think the hardest thing is you know working in the context of um, you know the 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 pandemic and working remotely. It's really hard mm -hmm. to build community. You know, a lot of like yeah. the conferences yeah. or tech events that that might have mm -hmm. been happening during this time have really kind of taken a backseat, uh, understandably so. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, I think that's something that I do miss is like that excitement around like, oh, you know, I'm going to go present in 
Lyon, France this week or, you know, something like that. Yeah. Uh, the jet set lifestyle of the tech industry. There we go. <laughs> kind of come to a grounding halt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I miss meeting new people. So I, I think, but I think yeah. that's, you know, set to improve hopefully in, in the coming months. Yeah. So, so do you, are you working remotely at this point in time? So your team, are they spread all over the place, all over the States, all over the world? Where, where are your team kind of based at the moment? Yeah, we've got a lot of folks over on the East Coast, so kind of Boston, Rhode Island mm -hmm. area. Um, but truly, we're a fully distributed company, um, fittingly. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, yeah, I'm over on the West Coast. Some, some folks are kind of in the central um, part of America. And uh, uh, yeah, it, it, we don't have an office at this point. We're fully kind of in our little areas. Okay, so how do how do then do you, do you have the opportunity to go out and and meet other people in the tech space at the moment, or is it kind of like you said everything is ground to a halt and it's kind of a little bit sort of wake up, go down to the home office, <laughs> close the door, leave, go home, up the corridor. You know what I mean? Is it are you are you how are you finding that as a whole? What are some of your challenges like in terms of staying connected with work or like how how are you dealing with the situation currently and, and yeah, I mean, what, what does the future look like for you in, in, in that, um, and for Unison as a team, is it remote long-term or is it kind of the goal to sort of move into something a little bit more, uh, in person? I, I think the goal is to stay remote. You know, it works for a lot of folks, um, you know, who have duties outside of work or, you know, and, and fundamentally I do really like it. Um, uh, for some reasons. So uh, one thing is we have had an online conference this past year. Um, yep. And I hope that that continues, you know, as we continue to grow the mm -hmm. community, maybe we'll even have an in-person component for next year. Um, mm -hmm. And another thing that we're doing um, actually in the coming month is we're going to have a company in-person retreat. So we've rented this oh, big, nice. yeah, we've rented this big mansion in, um, like Boston, uh, and we're all going to kind of swarm, uh, over there and it's got all these cool rooms and a tennis court and we're just going to work wow. you know, together and do more of the, you know, planning activities or sort of vision activities yeah. that would probably best be done in person. So, you know, we, we are oh, kind cool. of like bringing, bringing the crew together a little bit more, uh, now that that's become more of an option. Yeah, I think those we had a similar meetup in uh, September, uh, August with with exorcism, exorcism, beginning of August, and found that was really good for just like team connection and especially to sort of moving the needle on some of those big projects that either needed to be finished or kind of needed to be kicked off the ground. So I'm sure that'll be that'll be super fun. Now, um, Rebecca, you've also been highly responsible for the ex uh, for the Unison Exorcism track and uh, building that all out. Like, tell, tell us a little bit about that experience and kind of how you came across exorcism and, you know, what your hope is for that track going forward as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, that has been a really fantastic experience. So um, it, exorcism was initial, initially uh, serviced to me from my coworker, Stu, who uh, is a big fan of the platform and has used it before. Um, and at Unison, you know, I didn't have the resources to build out a full, like learning content management platform. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we're, we're a pretty small crew and we've got a lot of other objectives. And so I was like, how do I, how do I get people? 20 years later, <laughs> <you're a best> <laughs> <story>. <laughs> yeah, I'm still making <laughs> the platform. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so we knew we needed to partner with a different organization to, you know, get, get the unison language out there for folks to try. And, you know, hopefully if there was a browser component, mm. that would be really awesome because people could engage with the language in a really lightweight way. Um, and so when we saw what exorcism was offering, um, we were like, okay, this, this is a great community. It's, it's growing, you know, it's mm -hmm. free. So, you know, that's really cool. Our users would like that. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, we just decided, okay, this is going to be how people, you know, can, can practice, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the language. Um, so 
the process itself for building out the, the track is a little interesting because Unison is not a file-based language, right? Like your code base is, okay. is, ser- is, is hashed and saved into a code base. And most other languages operate with, with files on a file system. Yeah. Um, so there, there was some interesting technical challenges there. Um, uh, but just to expand on that a little bit, like what I'd love to, I mean, just not speaking as a non-technical person and I'm sure Jeremy and, uh, Eric would laugh at me at this point for asking a very technical question, but just, just dig into that a little bit into some of the challenges. And I'm sure people can pick up, um, a little bit what you're talking about. Um, if they're listening. Yeah. So in unison, you work in these things called scratch files, um, and scratch files are mm-hmm. anything suffix with a dot U and they're truly throwaway. They're throwaway files. Uh, you write your, your little program, you might run it, you know, kind of in a, a REPL-like mm-hmm. experience or a notebook-like experience, but then you delete the function from the, from the file, uh, cause you've saved it into, okay. you know, uh, uh, the Unison code base itself. Um, and so the Unison code base is the source of truth, not the file system. Okay. And, and where that becomes interesting with integrating with, with exorcism is of course, you know, uh, it, the exorcism looks at the at, at the file. It's handed a file and runs a bunch of tests against it, and then says, "Okay, the student has, you know, passed the test, or here's some issues." Um, and it ended up working out okay because every time you run the test, you basically um, get issued a, a new Docker container. Uh, there's some there's some technical stuff that happens on the back end that is really clever. Some magic wizardry. Thank yes, you, there's Jeremy. some magic wizardry. <laughs> yeah, Eric, Eric yeah. uh, you know, gets gets a bunch of snaps for for what uh, the platform does. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, it it ended up working okay. Um, but uh, mm-hmm. the fundamental model of of Unison as a language is that you know it's not a file persisted code base. Mm-hmm. Um, so if students want to save their work, kind of run per run what um, do you do <laughs> it's like <laughs> right. where do you where, <laughs> where does it go so, that, uh, so does that mean that does, does that mean a student has to start technically would have to start at the beginning of every like at the beginning of the curriculum pretty much every time because that's where my mind went was like oh no saving but maybe that's just the, the, the silly way that my brain processes but i was like oh wow I have to start again. <laughs> so the, the, the fortunate thing is the the web interface it it saves the last run. So like while we don't necessarily like save the file sy- system or save the file state, uh, the exorcism mm-hmm. platform itself saves the student's work. So that that's wow. really cool. That's that is is really a, a awesome. And then if a student is using on on the command line, well then they have access to the mm. full suite of the sort of whole Unison experience, right? Because then they're actually okay. downloading the Unison code base manager and working with it directly. So, uh, yeah, okay. there's a lot of flexibility <clears throat> between the, the web-based interface and, and working on the command line. Okay, that's 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 really interesting. I, it's so cool because every time I talk to a different maintainer or contributor on the Exorcism platform, just the nuance of each language and the little like intricacies and the stuff like that. It just, um, it blows my mind how many <laughs> different ways there are of, of, of doing stuff across, across the board. So, okay. So now you're at Unison. I think now would be a good opportunity to ask you the question that I hopefully prepped you enough beforehand for, um, around this whole concept of the hill that you would die on in the tech space. Ultimately, what one thing are you like, this is my, um, my view and I think it's absolutely essential and I wouldn't budge from this. I would fight. Well, we don't like the word fight necessarily <laughs> at exorcism. It's more like, what would you wholeheartedly put yourself behind and say, this is a, this is something that I really, um, want to stand by what, mm. what thought, or it could be like, put your functions before your CSS. I don't know. I'm just making something up, but it, I don't know what it could be anything. Uh, yeah. Um, my, my hill that I will die on is that I think, ha- I think tech too long has accepted toxic personalities at the cost of, you know, cause they're technically brilliant. Um, mm-hmm. and I, I think that that should be inverted. <laughs> I would much rather, <laughs> I 
I love it. Yeah. I would much rather work with 50 really, really competent, hardworking people than one mm -hmm. genius jerk. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I don't, I have never really understood, you know, the, the, the acceptance of like really toxic behavior. Um, mm -hmm. just, just cause someone is super smart. Um, that has always kind of. I, I have a feeling way. that that is changing slowly in in tech as a whole, and I think the reason and and you can tell me if I'm wrong because I'm well, I mean, exism's culture, I love it, I absolutely mm -hmm. love it, and I know I, I know what you're talking about, but um, in the sense that the more people that are learning from lots of different backgrounds and cultures and experiences. Um, the more that tech becomes a thing, I think the more you, we, we will see that, that inversion, I think, take place. And, um, and I think I'm, that makes me super excited. And I think just thinking about the tech space as an outsider, it actually at this point in time is really a transfer of wealth in a sense, because you mm. have a, a fairly small group of people who have knowledge because that knowledge, like even like understanding the command line or what the heck is going on with like your bash scripts and all of that kind of, I haven't, got a clue what's going on under the hood but the the tra the knowledge is causing a lot of money and energy and finance to go into that space because that's who have the skill and the knowledge and in order to do that so i think i hope i'm right in this over time over the next couple of years as people learn and people are able to push back and counter and come with different ways of understanding stuff that we will see that shift i'm, I'm positive um and i'm hopeful of that but um I think I agree with you on that. I think it's it's been really interesting. Like, ultimately, what I've experienced is you can have the genius, but actually the amount of energy required to manage that on an emotional level and plus the fallout with other people, plus the stress that other ha others have to handle yes. with clients, for example, or within the team, it, it actually... It, it it balances itself off and I've not seen like a wholly positive experience. Someone has to pay for that exactly. in the system. Someone is paying for that. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm very with you on that. And I think that's something that it, it, you can apply that also. It's like tech um, solutions for things. It's like, mm -hmm. this is the one way to do it. It's like, no, there's actually 20 ways and there's all trade-offs. And actually the maturity is to say, what is the trade-off that you're willing to accept? rather than being like, no, this is the, how it has to be done because it's always been done this way. Anyway, mm -hmm. pennies worth for me, but um, yeah. Yeah, wholeheartedly I think, uh, agree. I'm in agreement in, in that. Okay, cool. So I think we are both on the same page with, with regards to um, that whole hill. I'm realizing there's a lot of hills that I'm signing myself up for at this point in time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is every time you have and a like, podcast interview. I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'm like, wow, I, I, at the moment I'm dying on seven hills at this point, <laughs> um, at least. But uh, no, I, I really like that. So, so Rebecca, what, for you in the next couple of years, what, what is it that you're hoping to like learn or hoping to kind of see f f in your life um, in, in tech as a whole? Like what, what's your kind of dream? What's your perspective on that? Hmm. I think I would love to see the Unison community grow in a way that's really sustainable, that, you know, really welcomes people from different backgrounds into it. Like that's wholeheartedly, that's the reason I joined Unison um, was, mm -hmm. was the opportunity to kind of shepherd a community forward. But um, mm -hmm. in the long run, I would also love to re-engage with like people at the very beginning of their tech journeys, mm -hmm. you know, people who were like me, uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, who just were like, mm -hmm. what is, what is, you know, how do we make the internet work? You know, they're curious, but they don't necessarily have the background and, um, you know, have yeah. different ways of thinking about tech. And I would love to do, um, uh, programming for poets, you know, have, <laughs> uh, that would be amazing. Yeah. Songwriters and poets. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully, hopefully I do get to kind of engage with folks at the beginning of their journey um, in tech. I think that'd be mm -hmm. really awesome. So then if, if you had 10 people walk into a room right now who all completely had no idea about 
coding and development and the world that is within, what would your top three tips be for them to get going? And and they had no choice. They had to learn. It was like, <laughs> cool, you are here. There's no get out. You have to just get on with it. What would be your kind of, where would you start them and how would you go about doing that? I would tell them that they should look around the room and see everyone's success as their own. And then I would Mm -hmm. probably tell them to, I'd probably tell them to like invest in learning how to, to test, uh, test a system, uh, check their work. Um, Mm -hmm. I would tell them, Oh gosh. I would probably tell them about like using a debugger and practical stuff. But I think the first point is really what I would, I would tell them is to, to see, see everyone else's success as their own. Um, because on and some days think, that's I what mean, you I love, have. Yeah. 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 No, cause I, that's a really interesting point. So we, we ran these cohorts just recently. Um, I don't know if you know that we ran sort of, two 30 day learning experiences, um, in the Elixir track and in the go track. Yeah. So we've done, th- and, and we had like 300, no more than th- 700 people sign up for this, for the go track. And we had about a hundred on the, on the Elixir track. And it was so interesting because we w- we really wanted to do some experiments about how, how people would learn together because we realized that learning together is one of the key, the, the most key aspects in terms of accelerating people's uh, learning towards or uh, and achieving a goal. Um, so the fact that you said like, I really like that. And I think I'm going to have to talk to you more about that at some point about um, <laughs> making each other success your own, because I think if I'm honest, that is such a powerful tool in, in, in terms of learning. We often mm-hmm. operate as individuals isolated, <laughs> and actually one of the things we really feel is the acceleration comes from the community, from um, getting another person's perspective. And, and actually I think I'm going to have to poach that line and yeah. maybe ask you for it gently, <laughs> to make others a success. Please do. Um, Please share. As a priority. So um, maybe we could do something ar- around that, but um, that's really cool. I really like that. Awesome. So uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Rebecca, Thank you for your time. I think uh, it's been really cool just chatting and, and having a, a good time talking about coding and, and tech and all of that kind of stuff. So thank you for, for waking up early, for brewing the coffee and for, for making time for, for me this, this morning or you, in your morning. And um, yeah, appreciate it. And uh, for everyone listening, check out Unison Language. I'll, uh, I'll get the show notes rustled up and put in to the blurb and the description for this podcast. Um, but it's been great to have you. Thank you so much. And uh, I will stop the recording and then we will kill chat a little bit off the back of this. So stay Thanks, with Jonathan. me, Rebecca, but everyone else. See you later. Yeah.